I believe, well, um, welcome to all of you for the, I think it's the seventh in this series, Digging Deeper in Lockdown, um, uh, Archaeology in the Bible. Uh, last week, we were looking at the um, Holy Land, um, and uh, tonight we're carrying on in some ways with where uh, Jesus and the uh, ended and the early church began, going through the Book of Acts and following the journeys of uh, the Apostle Paul. So the title is In the Footsteps of, of Paul. Um, as uh, you'll know, I'm doing these tours because we currently in the UK can't uh, visit museums uh, and it's also not possible to do tours in countries like in the, in the Middle East. And so this is a way of bringing some of those artifacts and sites to a wider audience. But I want to dedicate uh, tonight to the um, Christian church in the country of Turkey. Um, it's while uh, we are about to have our museums reopen in August, uh, they have just lost a museum just this week. So the, the Hagia Sophia uh, building um, in the middle of Istanbul uh, has just been converted from, or is being converted now from being a museum into a mosque. And I'll show you a picture of that um, to, to, towards the end. It's appropriate to mention Hagia Sophia and Turkey because Paul, who's the subject of tonight's uh, webinar, was from the city of Tarsus. And Tarsus and many of the other cities that we're going to visit this evening are located in the country, which is now Turkey. And they were places where there were once thriving churches, uh, which is not the case and not the case now. Now, why are we looking at um, uh, the Apostle Paul and why is Paul important? Um, I, I don't pretend to have anything like his, uh, his boldness, his courage, his tenacity, uh, his genius for friendship, um, his brilliant thinking. Uh, he is somebody who was, who had a very clear purpose, but more than that, he was obsessed with a person and that person was, it was Jesus, um, a fellow Jew. Paul himself was a Jew, we're told in, a, in, a, in an autobiographical statement in uh, the, the, the letter of um, uh, Philippians, uh, that he was um, circumcised on the eighth day, Jewish, of the tribe of Benjamin. In fact, his parents called him Saul. Uh, Saul was the first king from the tribe of Benjamin, so clearly a, um, uh, an observant family. Uh, he was, um, uh, as for the law, he was a, a, a uh, Pharisee, Master Zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. So this is someone who had real strong Jewish credentials. Um, I'm not going to give you any immediate pictures of him, icons or anything else in case that uh, um, clouds your image of him, but there will be a statue later on. There'll be a couple of inscriptions. We're going to be looking at about five different uh, places Paul visited, including some surprising ones. Uh, and I hope you uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, the format's going to be the usual one. There's going to be ten um, ten parts to this. At the end, a brief reflection as to why Paul matters, um, and then um, there'll be I'll turn off the recording. Then there'll be a chance for some Q and A for those who are watching this uh, watching this live. So I'm going to begin with a map for you all, um, so you can see um, where we are. There's, there'll be a mixture of people watching this. Um, the principal source for things we're looking at tonight um, is the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts is largely narrative uh, and was written um, by Luke, a friend of Paul's. Uh, Luke is somebody who we mentioned in an earlier webinar um, on the Bible in the Ashmolean. So uh, the Book of Acts uh, is 28 chapters, begins in Jerusalem which you can see in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, hopefully. Uh, and the book ends in chapter 28 in Rome. Um, there are, um, so um, Paul's uh, famous conversion from being a persecutor of Christians to being um, a believer himself uh, um, happened on the road, on the way between Jerusalem and Damascus up here. Um, after a period of spiritual uh, reflection, discovery and questioning, um, he is based here in the, the city of 
Antioch, from where in Acts chapter 13, he is sent off um, on a missionary journey. The book of Acts, the first 12 chapters, the, the, the central character there really is Peter. And from chapter 13 through 28, the central character is Paul, who we're going to look at tonight. Tarsus here is, that's the city that Paul was from originally. Colossi, we're not going to be mentioning. Uh, Ephesus will get a mention. We're going to talk a bit about Troas and a Assos here, where there was a, a, a walk that Paul did, which is probably significant. Uh, Philippi is here. Um, Thessalonica, we're going to mention. Athens, I think, is around here somewhere. Um, for some reason, isn't on the map. Um, Rome here, and then we're going to do a surprise journey somewhere over here to the west near the, uh, near the end as well. And there's Corinth. This, that's called the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And the little neck of land in between uh, is an isthmus. And we're going to talk briefly about the Isthmian Games as well. So now the first slide, the first uh, real slide I'm going to show you uh, is where we join Paul's story in the Book of Acts. It doesn't actually begin in, um, in Tarsus, where he was brought up, but where he is as a young man, and he's heavily involved in persecuting the young church. Uh, in fact, in around AD 33, shortly after um, the death of Jesus under Pontius Pilate, his resurrection, and then the birth of the church, shortly after that, um, uh, Paul is on a mission to destroy the church. In another autobiographical um, note in a, a, a speech which Luke records, um, he says this, I myself was convinced that I ought to do everything possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And in this connection, I journeyed to Damascus. So in this next slide I'm going to show you is the um, um, so-called Damascus Gate. Um, that was a picture, obviously an old one, about 100 years ago or so. It looks the same now. The, the, the level of the ground was lower um, at the time Paul was leaving, so he wouldn't have gone through that gate, it would have been several feet lower down. But that is the Damascus Gate, where the road to Damascus leaves Jerusalem. Um, now, I mentioned that he then had, uh, after his conversion and his baptism in Damascus, he had this period of traveling and reflection. And tonight, we're going to take up the story really uh, from on the second and third of his missionary journeys. And these are recorded in the book of Acts from between chapter 16 and chapter 21. Uh, and then we're going to shoot forward to um, uh, Rome. So on his second missionary journey, um, and by the way, a bit like with the Holy Land, I found it very hard knowing uh, what to select for you. Uh, I've chosen hopefully a mixture. We're not going to do just ruin after ruin after ruin, because I think, uh, uh, being really honest, unless we're real specialists, we can't often tell the difference between one ruined uh, Roman marketplace uh, and temple and, and, and another necessarily. Uh, of course, if you're there in person, it's different. But uh, um, so I've just selected various places. So we're going to be on his second missionary journey. And he travels uh, to Europe, having had a vision and a calling to go to Europe. Uh, he goes to Philippi, which is a Roman colony, and from Philippi to um, Thessalonica or Thessalonica. Um, now, that's where the uh, when he writes his letter, one and two Thessalonians, that's written to the Christians in that city. Um, and Thessalonica is interesting because um, there uh, uh, Luke refers, Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, refers to um, Paul and his companion then Silas being dragged before people called the Polytarchs. Now, the Polytarchs is a very specific uh, title. It's specific to uh, that area of um northern Greece, where around, around Thessalonica, and um, uh, in, in my Bible, which I use currently, the, the ESV, it's, um, it's helpfully called the, um, the, you know, the city authorities, uh, because polytarchs, I wouldn't know what that was. So um, they sort of helped me along like that. But interestingly, there are very few references to um, polytarch. There are uh, just a handful. One of those references in archaeology is on an inscription from a gate in Thessalonica, uh, the gate was um, destroyed in 1867, but the inscription itself is now in the British Museum. And I'm going to show that to you in a minute. It's in the, it's in the basement, and um, it refers to the word polytarch. 
Um, this is significant because it shows a Luke was there um, traveling with Paul and therefore was familiar with the local titles. There's no way you'd know that if you weren't hadn't been in that area. And the second thing, it shows what an annoying person Luke was. Uh, I'm a lawyer, there's a range of lawyers. Some are very obviously lawyers, some less obviously so. The very obvious ones, um, well, I don't need, to, don't need to tell you. So Luke is one of those people who is actually very pernickety. So the fact he uses politarch rather than a more helpful phrase like the city authorities shows you the sort of person he was. And because he's that sort of a person, He's very unlikely to get any factual thing wrong, which means he's a very reliable historian. That's important to realize when we're looking at this book of Acts, uh, which gives us so much information. I'm going to show you now the inscription here. If you've been on one of my British Museum tours uh, and it was open, I'll have shown you this. Um, here we are. And um, here we are now a little bit of Greek for you here. Polytarch is there shown at the beginning. There's a P, a pi for P. Oh, look, that's a lambda that goes up like that. And anyway, there's a, you can just see a, of various letters there, T, there, A, there's an, a, a row, a R, looks like, a, looks like a P, R, then an X, a K at the end. Polytarch, that's the word polytarch. And that, there are only a handful of places where um, that word occurs in the whole world. And the, the reason I'm showing you this is to um, give confidence in the, the reliability of Luke uh, when he's recording, recording facts. Now, unfortunately, Paul didn't last there very long. Um, he had to uh, leave uh, Thessalonica. Um, he was chased out and he ends up then in Athens, uh, not Athens, Georgia, of course, but Athens, Greece. And in Athens, um, he is on his own but he can't help himself. And this is interesting. You wonder what sort of person is Paul? He can't help himself. He starts debating in the synagogue uh, and in the markets with people there in Athens uh, about the resurrection of Jesus. He gets a hearing. He gets summoned to the Areopagus. Now, just like uh, we talk about uh, you know, Westminster says, or Moscow says, or the Kremlin says, or the White House says, quite often places and the institution get mixed together. So the Areopagus both refers to a place, uh, Mars Hill, Ares, um, the god of war, Mars, god of war, um, Greek and Roman terms, um, and also it refers to the, the, um, the group or the committee or society that met there, that were based there, the Areopagus. So Paul gets called before this group, the Areopagus, um, and what you can't tell um, unless you go to Athens is just how close the Areopagus is to the Parthenon. Um, the Parthenon is the, um, the temple that was built to the goddess Athena, Athens, Athena, um, and it was already half a millennium old by the time Paul uh, arrived in Athens. And um, um, when you go there, and I'm a privilege to have been there, to stand on the Areopagus, you just realize, just looking over your shoulder, that the Acropolis, the hill with the path on top, is only just behind you. And it gives special color to what Paul uh, says when he's there. Now I did probably, I'm not the first one, or I won't be the last one to do this. It's very hard to resist uh, doing an address a bit like Paul. Um, there we are, Men of Athens is how he begins his, uh, his address to the Areopagus in Acts 17. But midway through his address, uh, Paul says, God does not live in temples built by human hands uh, as though he needed anything. Well, I wonder what particular temple might have come to mind. Well, the Parthenon was just over his shoulder. Um, so quite an extraordinary claim for Paul to make. And he says that even that the worship of idols that they had, um, he said, in the, you know, God is now overlooking such ignorance that we were subject to in the past. And he accuses the Athenians of being in ignorance. Uh, but now God calls all men everywhere to repent or to turn. Um, Athens, I'm just taking you here now so you can have a glimpse of it. Uh, the other thing I've got for you here, I'm excited to share with you. Um, I've got a stone, you know my habit of picking up stones. Here we are. So this is a stone, I, I wrote acro on it, which stands for the Acropolis, because otherwise I can't remember which stone is which. So here we are, that's a stone I picked up from the top of the um, Acropolis. Um, it didn't all fall down. 
Um, it's not one of the Elgin marbles, uh, and I'm not planning to return it. So that's just my little bit of stone that sits with my other uh, stones from nice places I've been to. Now, from Athens, Paul left and he went to um, the city of Corinth and he crossed that narrow neck of land. Do you remember I showed you that? The Isthmus, which gave its name to the Isthmian Games. Now, um, we've all heard of the Olympic Games every four years. And guess what? They took place, Mount Olympus. Um, here we've got um, the Isthmian Games, and they took place by the Isthmus, which went uh, across and took you across to the Peloponnesian Peninsula and to Corinth. Those games took place not every four years, but every two years. During those games, as in the Olympic Games, there was a truce between warring countries who were participating. And that means that because Paul spent two years in Corinth, we're told, that he would have been there during at least one of the games. Now, as a tent maker, he would have been in much demand because games required lots of tent making. I mean, Olympic villages, there were lots of needs for people to be involved in that trade. And we're told in the Book of Acts that that's what Paul did. Um, he worked with uh, Priscilla and, uh, and Aquila. And he was there for a couple of years. And I've just got, um, uh, this is going back to Oxford, uh, to the uh, Cast Gallery. Um, here I've got a picture here of a wonderful um, statue. This is a boxer in the Cast Gallery. Um, you can see his bound hands there. And uh, interesting question, what was Paul's attitude to sports? Well, he knew about sports. Um, various metaphors make their way into his, into his letters. There's one I've given you uh, in his letter to the Corinthians, I, I, who'd be familiar with boxing, of course. I, he says, I do not box as one beating the air. And then in his letter to his apprentice, Timothy, uh, Paul writes, uh, physical training is of some value. Uh, so no more couch potatoes, I'm afraid. Um, but godliness has value for all things. Um, so it's good. It's not the best thing, not worth devoting uh, everything to. It's not an ultimate thing, but it is of, uh, of some value. Now, also in, uh, in Corinth, we know he met all sorts of people, Priscilla and Aquila, I've mentioned. Um, but an interesting person who gets a mention later on uh, is um, the city's um, director of public works, he's described as. And so at the end of the book of Romans, um, uh, Paul, writing from uh, Corinth, or the neighbourhood of Corinth, writes to Rome, and he tells the church that Erastus, the city's director of public works, sends you greetings. So Erastus is sending greetings via Paul to the church in Rome. Now, amazingly, we know something about a person called Erastus who was a city official uh, because he uh, paved um, uh, an area of Corinth at his own expense and there's an inscription that shows it. And the inscription doesn't just have his name Erastus, it is a first century inscription. So I'm going to show you a picture uh, here. The person you can see in the background is uh, Mike D'Souza who was best man at my wedding. And there you can see um, uh, along here, you can see, um, you can just see uh, Erast, Erast, Erastus there, pro uh, Edal, he, that was his, his role uh, for his Edal ship. SP stands for Suak of Pecunia, at his expense, Stravit laid the pavings uh, here. So that's in this, and if you go to the city of Corinth today, uh, and amazingly, you can see that in Greece, um, I mean, if this was in England, it would be covered in glass and protected and barriers. Um, there you can see you could, I mean, you could probably come at night and dig it out if you wanted to. It's uh, just extraordinary um, how these objects are, uh, are, are there. Now, um, after Corinth, Paul briefly goes to um, Ephesus, then back to Jerusalem, and then he comes back to Ephesus a second time. And Ephesus is our next stop. Now Ephesus, or Ephes as it's called now in Turkey, E-F-E-S, uh, there's also a very nice beer called the Ephes beer. Um, so uh, it's an interesting place. Ephesus um, uh, is traditionally, it's the place where Mary died 
Mary, Jesus' mother, say, what on earth is she doing there? Nazareth? To, well, if you remember, Jesus on the cross um, gave Mary, his mother, into the charge of John. Um, John, the youngest of, of apostle, uh, uh, is believed to have ended his days uh, in Ephesus, taken Mary there with him, and um, uh, Patmos, uh, the area where he, uh, the writer of Revelation says he was uh, at the time of uh, his um, uh, receiving his dreams and his revelation um, is just off the coast of, of Ephesus. So there are reasons for thinking that might be true. But one thing we do know for sure is that Ephesus was the site of the Temple of Artemis or Diana, so which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it's it was absolutely huge. There was an archaic temple uh, which was vast and uh, that uh, I think came down in an earthquake around 367 BC. And then um, there was a new temple built that was um, already well recognized and established by the time Paul got there uh, uh, in what we're going to be looking at now. So I'm going to show you now. These are both um, uh, scenes in the British Museum. I picked this from the British Museum. Um, here we are. There you can see my two children. I know it's not very really good parenting, is it? That I'm sure no children were harmed in the making of this webinar. So those are my two. Um, they weren't actually holding it up, but it looked fun. Um, they're now um, very healthy, 20 and 18. Um, but I, I hope that gives you some idea of the sheer size of what that temple, the old temple, must have been like if that was sitting on top of one of its uh, pillars. And on the right, there is the, I want to call it the modern temple, not really modern, it's from first century. So the, the, the temple, um, and that column would have been seen by people, you and I's names will recognize, Timothy, Priscilla, Aquila, Apollos, and Paul himself. So this is a reminder that these places uh, are you know, real. And you're looking at something that would have been seen by one of these people. I mean, what were they wearing? How were they feeling that day? Had they had breakfast with Paul? Had they, I mean, it's just extraordinary. Were they on their way to the lecture hall of Tyrannus where Paul was doing his daily uh, Bible studies. But it's amazing when you're in the British Museum just to be looking at something that was looked at or certainly would have seen or overlooked the city uh, of these people that we know about who are real people, who are characters mentioned in the book of Acts and in, in Paul's letters. Now, uh, Paul's preaching uh, for two years in Ephesus was so effective, it says that the whole of the province of Asia heard the word of God. That there was a, um, a riot began because um, the, um, the, the major industry, which centered around um, tourism, stroke pilgrimages, and um, the veneration of Diana or Artemis, uh, was under threat. And uh, the Book of Acts records that people rushed into the theater. The theater you can see there um, uh, on, the, on the right, they rushed into the theater and they, from that place, they shouted for, for two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Paul wants to go in and speak to them. Um, incredibly courageous man. Um, and it says that some of the leaders of the city, the Asiarchs, uh, friends of him, urged him not to go in. And that also, uh, you know, we're talking about, um, the reason we're looking at the footsteps of Paul, by the way, is we're not interested in his shoe size. We're interested in the heart and the mind and the person and what drove him. And F.F. Um, Bruce's book, Paul and Friends, makes this point that he had a genius for friendship. And you wonder what sort of person wins the respect and friendship of the city officials, They're not Jews, not Christians. Um, I mean, they respected his wisdom, his rhetoric. I'm sure he was a, a, a wit, um, very well educated. They wanted to keep an eye on Paul. They liked him. And uh, that makes you think, what sort of person wins the respect? Uh, he wasn't just a, a, a madman that people could write off. He won the respect of the leaders of the city of Ephesus. Um, and on the right there, you can see the road leading away. That's called the Harbour Road. At the end of it was the harbour. Uh, the sea is now was further away, much further away than it was um, in the first century. Um, I remember a very um, an Italian friend of mine uh, looking at this picture and just laughed. And I said, why are you laughing? He said, you look such an English boy in that. I said, what do you mean? He said, look at the black socks. 
So they're much more conscious about fashion in Italy, of course. And ever since then, I've been very conscientious and made sure that I always have white socks uh, when I'm wearing, uh, wearing trainers. Now, something interesting happened after this. Um, uh, Paul had his period in Ephesus, and it was a little while before he came past Ephesus again. During that little while, he uh, went round to the area of Corinth, wrote the book of Romans, and we think some other things uh, must have happened uh, because Paul's tone changes in his next communication with the Ephesian church through the elders there. Acts 20 recalls Paul and a band of others uh, traveling from um, Troas, which uh, was the name at the time for the old city of Troy, you know, wooden horse. Um, and uh, they traveled from Troy, and this is one of the we passages, so Luke is in that group. And they're traveling south from Troy, and they go past Ephesus, and Paul wants to meet the Ephesian elders, and then he wants to head all the way to Jerusalem. But something has happened, and I want to read a little bit now from um, Paul's speech to these Ephesian elders who he met there on the on the uh, on the beach it says um, um, he says I'm going to Jerusalem no surprises there constrained by the spirit not knowing what will happen to me there hmm. except the holy that spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me I only want to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus. There's a clue into his sense of identity. He's a man, he's got a brief. He knows what he's been asked to do. His desire to finish reminds us of Jesus' prayer in, in Luke 17, where he says, Father, um, I've completed the work that you gave me to do. And on the cross, it is finished. Paul had that desire to finish. Um, I, and then he said, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about will see my face again. This is like a pessimistic Paul. What's, what's all this? Why is he so sure there's not going to be a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth missionary journey? It seems that things are coming to a climax and he knows it. It's been revealed to him in some way. Part of this as well led to him having, doing a walk, which I think would have been his equivalent of Gethsemane for Jesus. So at Troas, uh, in Acts 20, it records that Paul asked to be left on shore by his friends, and he walked about 31 kilometers from Troas to Assos, while he and well, his friends traveled round by ship. The reason for doing that, to be alone with God, to pray. That's invariably why people want to be alone in, um, you know, in, the, in, the, in the Bible. Now, why was that necessary? Because he had some premonition, some warning of what was to come. And like Jesus at Gethsemane, he wants to pray, perhaps like Paul, like, like Jesus, to say, let this cup be taken from me and to find the strength to follow through on what his mission, what he'd been called to do. I don't have uh, any slides from that little journey, uh, the bit from Trias to Assos. I've got a slide here from a little bit further around the coast on the way to Patara. Paul would have sailed past this coast with his friends. I mean, it's beautiful. Um, see the incredible blue of the, um, of, the, of the Mediterranean. Paul's ship would have sailed within a mile or so of this coast. But you can imagine Paul uh, walking and praying that at that time. From there, he goes to um, Caesarea um, and to Rome, where he delivers the uh, offering he's brought to the church there. Uh, he is then um, uh, grabbed by a lynch mob in the uh, in 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 the temple, and is rescued by the Romans and taken into Fortress Antonia. I showed you some pictures of that in our last in our webinar last week from uh, from the Holy Land. Um, he's then taken and he's then in Caesarea uh, for two years in prison. Um, that's one of the possible places where he may have written the, the prison epistles there or Ephesus or, or, or Rome. He's there for two years. Again, for more on Caesarea, please look back to my webinar last week. Um, and uh, he then travels by sea. Uh, there's a shipwreck and he ends up in Rome. Uh, there's a fire. There's a snake. It's a bit like the adventures of Paul. 
Now, it's interesting, in antiquity, who else began their, a journey in Troy and ended up in Rome? Well, none other than the founder of, of Rome, Aeneas, in uh, Virgil's Aeneid. And that point, I'm sure, wouldn't have been lost. And uh, Luke describes this epic voyage of Paul's, and he ends um, uh, his book, The Acts of the Apostles, in chapter 28, with Paul in Rome for two years, um, preaching without hindrance the kingdom of God. But it doesn't end with Paul's death. Uh, I promised you a, a statue or a representation of Paul. Um, here we are. We've now got to Rome, and there is in St. Peter's Square, uh, an ex yeah, a wonderful statue of the Apostle Paul. He's got a sword, uh, you see, in his right hand. Now, that's a clue, by the way. Um, uh, if you see a statue of a man with a beard, it could be any one of the... Um, any one of the apostles, but if he's got a bunch of keys, he's not a locksmith, that means that's Peter who was given the keys of the, of the kingdom um, in uh, Matthew 16. And if he's got a sword, then you're looking at Paul. Now, why has he got a sword? Interestingly, um, when I was on a, a, a tour group in Rome, our Italian tour guide said, oh, Paul has a sword because he used to be a Roman soldier. Well, the, the group I was with, um, also, that cannot be the case. Um, and we quoted that passage that I mentioned at the beginning, circumcised on the eighth day uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And, uh, and she said, oh, no, we know he's a Roman soldier because of his sword. I mean, it wasn't her fault. She'd been trained that way. But of course, the reason he has the sword is because by his own admission, Paul had been a persecutor and a violent man. Uh, there may also be references to him being a um, wielding the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, for his preaching and traveling. Um, but a bit of background, that's Paul in Rome. But his story doesn't end there. Now, let me tell you a little bit now, and you, I'm not sure if you, you can work out where we're going next. Um, one of the um, early popes, as they became known later, uh, bishops of Rome, was called Clement. And in a book called... Um, uh, one Clement, he wrote this about Paul. Now, Clement is writing towards the end of the first century. So this is only 35 years. I mean, he probably knew Paul. I mean, as a very old man, or might have met him. I mean, he would know certainly know people who knew Paul. And Clement writes this. Um, after Paul had been seven times in chains, well, it's fascinating. There's lots we don't know about Paul. If you look through the list of all of his trials in 2 Corinthians, half the things we don't know when they happened. Um, I, I wish we could see the extended version of all the, the, the outtakes from the book of Acts sometime. He said, after he'd been seven times in chains, had been driven into exile, had been stoned, and had preached in the East and in the West, he won the genuine glory for his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world, and having reached the farthest limits of the west well where was the farthest limits of the west it wasn't rome those of you who are familiar with the film gladiator will know that uh, spain or the iberian peninsula was had been a, a, a joined up was part of the roman empire uh, since the reign of augustus it was firmly part of the roman empire at the time of paul um, we also know that paul had aspired to go to Spain. Um, now, my next picture, I've, um, I'm very pleased. I've got my friend uh, Steve Schneider is watching here today. We went and did a little stretch of the, um, the Camino uh, de Santiago in Spain um, last year. And at the end, I took a break and I headed to Segovia, um, where I've got friends and saw this amazing Roman aqueduct, which is, it's, from around the first century. There's actually no date on it. Most likely it was built during the reign of Trajan, actually, just very start of the second century. Uh, for more on Trajan, do see our uh, previous webinar on the Bible in the Ashmolean. But it's an extraordinary um, uh, construction. Um, I asked my friends who I was with, I said, well, wh wh why is this, um, you know, why hasn't this all been taken apart and used to build churches or other structures? Because that's often what happens with these 
old buildings. And my friend said, no, it's because this was used still to carry water as recently as 50 years ago. That's why it was never taken down. And it's there to this day. And there's a bus station right next to it. I mean, it's right part of the, part of, part of the city fabric. And there you can see, um, the second quote down there, I, well, this is Paul writing. Look at his very clear intention. He tells the church in Rome, writing from around Corinth, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, did Paul actually make it to Spain? Uh, Tom Wright, whose uh, biography I've been reading, um, said, um, said his conclusion is quite possible. Quite possible. Um, sorry, you've got a sneak preview there of our final slide. Somewhere that Paul didn't go that we know of was to Istanbul or Constantinople, as it was to become. So Constantinople, founded by Constantine, more on him in our first um, session on Alexander the Sausage Seller, if you, if you want to do that. Uh, it's pronounced Hagia Sophia. Uh, you can see the building at the top. It's in the news even today. Uh, this is the building that was a church for around 900 years, then a mosque for about 500 years, and then turned into a museum by Ataturk uh, when the state became secular, a secular one. And just this week, it's been decreed by the president that it is to be converted again for prayers to be a mosque. It was built in 537 by the Christian Emperor Justinian. And it's repeated that at his opening, he very modestly uh, fell on his knees and said, Oh, Solomon, I have outdone thee. Um, yeah, in, interesting, interesting comment. Uh, to be fair, it was an impressive building. I think it was the largest building enclosed space in the world for about a thousand years. I mean, that's extraordinary to be at the pinnacle of our, you know, architecture. Is there the Hagia Sophia? Uh, that's one of my favorite pictures on the right there. Oh, by the way, if you've seen From Russia with Love, that's where the, the murder, there's an assassination that takes place uh, in the Hagia Sophia. But there you got on the right, you can see this ex beautiful, I mean, this is, this is uh, built in 537. Uh, a huge, uh, wonderful building, and it took some of the best um, um, uh, marble and stone from around the empire uh, to construct. And there's a door there you can see, which is called the Splendid Door. This was brought from a pagan temple from none other than the city of Tarsus, which is where Paul began. That door that temple, which that was from, would have been known to Paul as a Jew growing up before he met uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus, um, that temple. Now, what does this mean? Does this door being moved from Tarsus to Hagia Sophia in 537 mean that paganism uh, has been destroyed, that Christianity somehow has conquered all uh, through God using people like Paul and others? Unfortunately, no. This might be an appropriate time for us to uh, move on and um, talk about the uh, medieval church and uh, with the appropriately named 10 Papal Nasties. Um, but that would be departing from the theme of this series, which is archaeology in the Bible, with some excursions to talk about Oxford's Christian heritage. And that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to be going to the relatively modern city of Oxford for that pigeon's eye view of church history from the spire of the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin. But before that, um, uh, uh, as I promised, let's just slow down for a moment to think a little bit about Paul uh, and his legacy. Um, as I said, it's not his footsteps we're really interested in. It's his, it's his mind, it's his heart. Um, what drove him? Um, Tom Wright in his book, here you can you can see it i think this is probably the same a picture from the um uh, picture of that same statue i showed you from st peter's square um this is what he says about paul uh, for paul this is in his final chapter the challenge of paul for paul there was no question about the starting point it was always jesus 
And Jesus, not just as the label to put on an idea, a theological fact, if you like, but as the living, inspiring, consoling, warning and encouraging presence, the one whose love makes us press on. Quote from 2 Corinthians 5. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Another quote from Paul's letters. The one whom to know, Paul declared, was worth more than all the privileges that the world, including the ancient biblical world, has to offer. And that's how he concludes his list of worldly achievements that I mentioned at the beginning, a Hebrew of Hebrews, etc. Jesus was the starting point and the goal. The goal, yes, because Paul never wavered in his sense that Jesus would reappear. And here's a challenge. I believe that Jesus will reappear. Um, this is Christian hope. Um, this is our faith. It's in the creeds. It's what Paul believed. It's what drove him on to want to present the Gentiles as a sacrifice pleasing uh, to, to, to God. When I was at um, Cambridge doing theology, um, there was one lecturer, I remember, lecturer who said, um, you know, for the skeptic who has a naturalistic explanation of everything, a humanistic explanation, and therefore, you know, no resurrection, no, uh, no miracles, Christianity just sort of evolved because kind of it was the time for it to evolve. He says that the skeptic has got to take into account of two facts. Um, I've got to fit in. The first is the fact of Jesus's death by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, it's a fact, and the empty tomb. So that's fact one. Sounds like two, but that's one. Second fact is the conversion of the man, Paul. What was going on there? What made somebody change? like that what drove him it's a powerful question uh, i think what we've seen on our tour is just that paul is an extraordinary person and you can't just write him off we want to know what drove him and we've had an answer there um, from tom wright but it's there in all paul's writings what drove him it's very simple Jesus, his knowing Jesus, not as somebody who did something a while ago, but as alive and active and a presence, an answer, uh, someone who heard his prayers and somebody who would return. Uh, as ever, I'm just going to take you now to just to review what we've been doing today. Here we are. So there, these are the 10 slides that we've, uh, or 10 places we've been together. And that's the plan for next week. And I hope you can, I hope you'll be able to join me there. So until then, uh, I hope you have a very good week. Thank you.